my clicker over there, but we just have one slide this morning, so we'll keep it simple. Good to see you. Good to be back. Um, I feel like it always happens where me and Keaton are like preaching right after we come back from something. It's like there's always a weekend trip or a week trip. This week, uh, me and Ashley and Parker were uh, at the Fried Hardeman Lectureship, which is where I, we both went to college, and we had a great time. Uh, got to see plenty of people. Uh, the guys were there as well. We had to be with them all week, um, as if we couldn't get enough here, but uh, it was good to see them, good to see everybody, and uh, we had a good time. But I was thinking about being back at Fried Hardeman, where I went to school, where I went to college, uh, we also have some other people visiting that also went to school at Fried Hardman, and um, it's a good place that I love. And so I got to hear plenty of my professors that were my Bible teachers, uh, that were doing lectures, teaching this whole week, and I saw one of my least favorite professors, because he was the one, he would always ask questions, like these real broad questions about the Bible, about the story of Scripture, and he would always ask these really broad questions, and he was looking for a very specific answer. You ever had a teacher like that? Right? He was a good teacher. It was also one of the hardest classes that I had, so that kind of makes sense. Um, might, might have done it to myself. I don't know. But he would ask these really broad questions, you know, like, like um, I don't know, why were we created? And he was just expecting you to read his brain and know what he was talking about. And I hated it. But I'm going to do the same thing to you this morning. <laughs> so I've got two really big questions. And I'm going to ask you a question to. They have the same. I'm going to ask you a question of these two questions. And they have the same answer. Real big, broad questions. Why did Jesus come to earth? Pretty sure that was an actual question he asked us. And I was really confused one time. Why did Jesus come to earth? And the second is, what was the point of the cross? I'll tell you guys, like I tell uh, the guys and girls in Bible class a lot of times, you can cheat a little bit. You know, we've all read the book, um, and you can see the PowerPoint. The answer to both of those questions is reconciliation. It's a real big Bible word that we use again. I think Keaton's really testing the legitimacy of my Bible degree when he gives me these big, tough topics, you know. But it's a good, big, fancy word. And we want to dig in this morning to see what reconciliation means and why it's a part of this firm foundation that we're trying to build in our understanding of Scripture and our relationship with God and our understanding of how we can have a relationship with God. What is reconciliation? Uh, Oxford defines reconciliation just in a, in a secular you know, term way. Uh, it says, "...the restoration of friendly relations." It's a pretty good way to put it, pretty, pretty simple way to put it. The restoration of friendly relations. You could just say simply, to restore a relationship, right? Reconciliation could be to restore a relationship. We talk about reconciliation all the time. This is something that comes up when we're talking about um, racism. We talk about race, rec racial reconciliation. We talk about reconciling to a friend or a family member that we have been apart from for so long. We're understanding that the, the relationship that we once had was lost. We have to be reconciled. This word really doesn't show up a ton in Scripture, um, but we're going to look at the places where it does, of course. Um, and it really doesn't even show up much at all in the Old Testament at all. At least in terms when it's talking about us and our relationship as humans reconciling to God. It comes up a couple times in the New Testament that we're going to look at. But in order to restore a relationship then that necessarily means that it had to have been broken in the first place, right? In order to have to restore a relationship, you're putting it back to what it once was. And again, as the, the guys in the, in the teen Bible class right now know, I love a good backstory in Genesis chapter 3. So turn there with me. I love a good story that starts in the Garden of Eden. But if you really think about it, that's where not only everything starts, but that's where the beginning of most of our uh, themes that, that go through the entirety of Scripture start. Because this is the place where God created the first man and woman. This is the first time, the first place where God had a relationship with humanity. And everything was perfect. It was good, as he said. 
It was holy. It was close. God was near to his people. And something happened. And if we want to understand why this relationship is broken, if we want to understand how to get back to a good relationship, to be reconciled to God, we have to understand what happened in the first place. What broke it? What messed everything up? And that's why we look in Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 and 24, through 24. Then the Lord God said, this is after they had eaten of the fruit. The Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim with a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the tree of life. This story right here, that moment, marks a turning point in human history. Do you realize that? It was early in human history, but that's a major turning point in human history where humans lived and walked with God and no longer did so after this moment. That's a big deal, right? And we have to understand the weight of this moment to understand how big of a deal it is. Just like Adam and Eve have lost that opportunity through their sin, we're not unlike Adam and Eve. Our sin has put us in a difficult, broken relationship with God. And it's because as we continue through the Old Testament, you start in Genesis, you go through Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all of these crazy laws. And if you're reading through the, the, uh, the Bible in a year, you might be getting close to reading through some of those laws, so stick with it. Don't drop out. Uh, they have a purpose. And really, the purpose of a lot of the Levitical laws, the law of Moses, to boil it down in a way that if, if you'll understand what I'm saying, you'll see, it's basically to tiptoe around the fact that we live in a broken state. How do we live in this world wanting a relationship with God but being broken? How do we do that? That's what all of those laws are about. And they're weird, and they're convoluted, and they don't make any sense to us anymore, right? Because it's difficult to understand what eating pork has to do with being in a good relationship with God. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us, but they're all about how to live our lives in a way that we can have a good relationship with God. Obviously, we know those are not the benchmark anymore. The law was fulfilled with Christ's death, and we don't live in that way with the law of Moses anymore. But we'll get to that in a minute. But the point is, and the point of the law of Moses, what the law of Moses was trying to teach us, trying to teach them back then, trying to teach us today still, is that our sin has a consequence. There's a legal requirement between us and God in our relationship that must be fulfilled. That must be fulfilled. Our relationship between God cannot be satisfied until the payment for our sin is made. You know, if you think of any other kind of justice system, uh, you think of any courtroom in America, hopefully in America, if somebody were guilty of something, they were brought before the court and they clearly, based on all the evidence, there was no doubt they did this. They were caught on video and everyone in the courtroom, the spectators, the jury, the judge, sat and witnessed this, this failure, this broke, breaking of a legal system, and the person standing there just says that, that is, is found to be guilty, and they just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Would any good, just judge say, oh, all right then. See you later then. We can, we can close up. We can pack up for the day. I thought this was going to be a lot longer of a court uh, case. And if you were on jury duty, you are probably like, thank you. No judge, we would hope no judge in the name of justice would say that that satisfies the requirement of the law. Are you following? Right? There's something that must be paid. If someone is guilty, something must be paid. And this is the theme through the entirety of the Old Testament. We have a law that taught us how our sin breaks our relationship with God. And we're confused. 
and we're left in a lost state. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 12, really kind of demonstrates this relationship. It puts it in New Testament terms for us. Ephesians 2, verse 12. He says, Remember that you were, at that time, separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers of the covenant of promise. And get this, having no hope and without God, in the world. That's our state. That's our existence without Christ. He, he's speaking before Christ. Remember that you were at once one time, you, and he's speaking to Jews here presumably, you had no citizenship, obviously important to them. You had no claim to the promise that's been given to Abraham and through the entire generations. You had no claim to that. You had no hope and without God in this world. We covered this in an Ephesians series that we did on Sunday nights last year, and it just reminded me, though, of, again, the weight of this situation. I mean, can, can you think of a more scary text than that? Having no hope and without God. Does it get much worse? I don't think it could get much worse. But thankfully, we have some more verses to read. Leave it up to Paul to leave us uh, the word but in there to, to keep going. Starting in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And here it is, that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Again, you notice he said the word hostility there twice. That's an interesting word to kind of throw into this conversation. Again, we're talking about this requirement that is due according to the law, right? And Paul's highlighting that here. Because of our situation, because of our sin, we have a problem. There's a barrier. He calls it a wall of hostility that stands between us and God. And, of course, he's saying that through Christ, he's broken down that wall of hostility. He's killed the hostility. I think I've said this before once, and if I haven't, I hope to say it now and, and a couple other times, because this is, this is really crucial, at least in my understanding of the entirety of Scripture. In order to understand God's grace fully... We have to understand our sin and his wrath, right? You remember the story that Jesus told of um, the, the two people that were in debt to, to a ruler? He said, which one is going to love him more, the one who has the big debt that got canceled or the small debt that got canceled? And we can understand that. Um, the more we are in debt to someone or something and that debt gets forgiven, the more we fully comprehend how amazing that is, right? Anybody can, can lend you $5 for a Coke, right? But it's different when it becomes $2.3 or whatever number, okay? That's a little different. So to fully understand God's grace and how much he's truly given us, we have to understand our sin, the predicament that we're in, and we have to understand his just wrath on that sin. That's good. We want justice. And we don't want a uh, watered-down truth, right? We don't want a watered-down Christianity. We want the whole truth. The whole truth is, and I, I think he hit on this a couple weeks ago, the whole truth is that God's wrath is coming for the guilty. Right? That's what we see in Scripture. He'll separate the sheep from the goats. That's what's going to happen. His followers, the blameless, on the other side of the guilty, the goats. But it's funny because, um, speaking of goats, Hebrews tells us the blood of bulls and goats can't satisfy that requirement, right? Just the blood of animals is not satisfactory. It's not an equal payment for the sin that we have 
created. Our sin must be paid for by us or by someone else. And as Romans 6.23 says, you know the verse, that the consequence, the payment of sin is death. And somebody has to pay that, legally speaking. For justice to be carried out, someone has to pay that. That's what justice is. That's what the legal requirement um, requires. There's a, another way to, to see this, the space between us and God. There's a song called Living Hope that I learned in college and that we sang a lot. And I hope to teach here eventually. Living Hope. And it starts off by saying this. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. How great the chasm between us, right? The difference between God and me is so far. He's so holy, and I'm so sinful. He's so good, and I'm so bad. And we have this problem that must be reconciled. And that means... To reconcile is to mend the relationship that we broke. Now turn to Romans chapter 5. This whole idea is sprinkled all through Romans. We read from Romans 6. Um, there's there's plenty, of, plenty of times in Romans where it deals with this relationship with Jesus through his death. And in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 8, it says this. But God shows his love for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, so much so now that we are reconciled will we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's all Jesus that we have reconciliation. It's because of Christ's blood through his death that we are saved from God's wrath. Jesus paid for our sin. What we caused, the problems we caused, the trouble we caused... The space, the chasm that we put between ourselves and God, the legal requirement of the law based on our faults, Jesus paid for on our behalf on the cross. And because of that, we are reconciled to God. That's how reconciliation works. Now, earlier I asked what the point of the cross was, and I asked, um, why did Jesus come to earth? And uh, I agree, that wasn't a very fair broad question to ask you. But I say reconciliation because wrapped up in the idea of reconciliation, the reason Jesus came to earth was to reconcile us, wrapped up in that term reconciliation is love and mercy and kindness and grace and sacrifice and forgiveness and atonement. All of, he had to have all of those things to be able to die on that cross for us. He had to have all of those things just to uh, reconcile us back to God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Once our relationship with God has been mended, we're a new creation. We're new. That's the point. Do you remember the story where the woman pushed through the crowd to touch the hem of Jesus' garment? You remember what's so interesting about that story? The same as when Jesus uh, healed other people and healed lepers and things. If we're thinking back to the Old Testament law and the way that things worked and the rituals of purification and, and the clean laws and things like that, 
The problem was if something unclean touched something that was clean, they were both unclean, correct? Right? That was kind of the whole point. You're supposed to keep them separate. It's supposed to be clear. But here, an unclean woman who needed purification touched Jesus, and they both became clean. You see how amazing that is in Jesus? They both became clean. She was made clean. Her blood dried up. Her life was changed. Jesus has that effect on people. He should. He cleans us, cleanses us. Our lives are changed. The youth group went and saw The uh, Chosen yesterday. If you've seen the show, we've talked about it before, but um, they're showing a couple of the episodes in theaters, so we thought we'd go, go watch it in theaters and get the, the full uh, experience. And Jesus' character was talking to uh, Matthew in the show. And this doesn't give anything away. I'm, I'm not going to spoil it if you are watching it. Jesus' character was talking to Matthew. And Matthew had the problem with Peter. He was really, they've been at each other's throats the whole time. They just don't get along in the show. And Matthew was saying that he just didn't understand why Jesus would have picked Peter. Well, I, I just don't understand you... Uh, he's hot-headed, he, he's too brash, um, he's irresponsible, he's unpredictable. Why would you have picked him? Matthew's a tax collector, he's very responsible, okay? And Peter's not, they're the opposite. He just didn't understand why he would have picked Peter. He said that he's all those things. And then Jesus' character said, I make people what they aren't. I make people what they aren't. You know that better than most. That's what he said to Matthew. Matthew wasn't a disciple, and then he was. Jesus makes people what they aren't. We're not clean. We're not holy. We're not saved. We're not friends of God. We're enemies. We're sinners. And Jesus makes us what we aren't. And we know that better than most. Probably better, I hope, better than most people out in the world. I hope that we never uh, show any kind of arrogance that we are saved, right? Our position should be more humble knowing that we understand how God should be angry at us. But we're blessed in the peace of his grace and mercy through Jesus' blood on the cross. He takes us from being enemies of the cross... And he brings us near to God. Near like walking with God. And near like in a relationship with God. Kind of like the Garden of Eden. God has reconciled, as we saw in, in so many of these verses, God has reconciled all people to himself. That's how, he, that's how he phrases it in his book. He's reconciled all people to himself. And he's waiting on you. He's done his part of the law. He's offered the free gift of eternal life, and it's yours to accept. If you haven't been baptized into Christ, you haven't become like him in his death, and you won't be like him in his resurrection. That's the point of baptism. God is pleading with you, and I'm pleading with you this morning to come to Christ, to be reconciled to God, to be back in a good relationship with the creator who loves you and who made you. And if we can help you to learn how to do that, to talk that through with you, or if you've made that decision and you want to do that today, we'd love to help you put on him in baptism. And we're going to sing a song in a minute. You can stand and, uh, and come forward and sit on any of these pews. We'd love to talk with you and sit with you. If you have any other need, won't you please come as we stand and sing.